Chief Investment Officer Gary Reynolds is with me to talk about what he thinks the potential implications of the recent budget might be for the economy and for the Courtiers Fund. Gary, hi. Hi, Leo. Shoot. Well, I think it was quite a relief watching the budget yesterday, actually, because we were back to what I would say was normal kind of interaction between the, the two main parties in, in, in our country. Um, Tories seem to have gone back now in favour of smaller government and Labour in favour of bigger government. Um, but what I was pleased about is I think we needed to do something. We seem to have been on the fence for a long time, neither really investing in the public sector and neither have we been investing as families or as businesses. So the rate of investment in the UK has been tragically low for too long. And I think that has been a, a result of the way in which we've done austerity, which hasn't worked. So interestingly, I think this is the second most interesting budget in the last 14 years. The one before it being the August 2022 budget of Quasi Quarteng, which actually, I think, taken at face value, tried to shock the economy back into growth in a different way that Rachel Reeves has done it. So Labour, Rachel Reeves is going for more public sector investment and Quarteng went for lower taxes, relying on families and businesses to do the investment. In ways, it doesn't matter. You pay your money, you take your choice. But this is a lot better than the nothingness we've had from many a Tory government in the last 10 years or so. Interesting point you make about taxing businesses, how that might encourage innovation. Yeah, well, the, it, it's not so much the tax on businesses, it's the tax on workers. And um, whether, whether it's employer NI or employee NI, it's still a tax on work. When it's paid for by the employer alongside more rights for workers in the same way, the increase in taxation on a packet of fags has deterred people from smoking. This will deter people from employing uh, individuals. Does it matter? Possibly not, because unemployment is very low. So there are a lot of jobs seeking workers and not enough workers to go around. What it may do indirectly, and if Rachel Rees has designed it this way and it works, she will take great credit for it, is to force employers to not keep bumping up their staffing levels to meet extra demand, but to invest in better equipment, better systems to do it so they can produce more with less people. And that in the long run is the positive growth you need so that everybody's better off. Thanks, Gary. Rachel Reeves mentions the way that public debt's measured as a percentage of GDP, which is something you've spoken about before. Yes, I have thought public sector net debt as a method of measuring um, the financial situation of the government has been weak and there are better measurements around. So public sector net debt is everything the government owes less liquid assets, but it doesn't account for longer term assets, financial assets, or any tangible assets like buildings and roads and land. Mm. So she has touched on this and I am going to look at this in detail. Um, and I promise that I'll make it interesting <laughs> in the client December 7th. Because it takes a certain mentality to find the methods in which public sector debt is recorded um, to, to, to get excited about this work. But it, it is a good thing. And because the UK government has stacks of assets, which we never talk about. So let me give you an example, an extreme example, just to make a point. If we were going to count, if we were going to measure uh, an individual's financial well-being by their debt, we'd like to get it wrong. But I'd say to you, um, Sandra here has debt of 250,000. John's got debt of 20,000. Who's worse off? And the answer is you can't know because if Sandra's got a £250,000 mortgage and a 500000 property, while John has got no income and 20000 credit cards worth of debt, Sandra's definitely a lot better off. So the assets you've got 
are very important. And I, I, I'm not surprised that Rachel Rees has been prepared to look at this because she is a trained economist. She worked at the Bank of England. So hopefully she's going she's gonna to look at the way in which we record things and do things. Because the one thing I will touch on in this seminar is that families and businesses have been paying down debt and are wealthier than they've ever been, whilst the government has been taking the strain in having to make some investments to make up for the lack of investment in the private sector. And our country is in extraordinary good nick. It's just a case of having a politician that can tap into that and get that wealth working. Might this affect how you and the investment team look at opportunities in the UK? I think it does. Because whichever way you, whichever way you view this, this autumn budget is a budget from a stable government, mm. which we've not had for a while. So political upheaval creates uncertainty for business and families and puts them off saving. So when things get a little bit difficult, people save more. They did that through the, 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 the pandemic. Um, so if there's a sense of stability, even if you disagree with what Labour are doing, and I certainly disagree with, with lots of it, but at least if you know what the rules are going forward, you can plan accordingly. So I think that their policy on getting more houses built is extremely positive. And as UK businesses are generally cheap compared to their, their counterparts in the US, I think there's fantastic opportunities in, in this country. And we've got some great sectors. Um, so I think what this heralds is uh, a, a potentially very, very attractive period for investing in the UK. Have the Courtiers Funds been well positioned going into this? Yes, they are very well positioned because we've lent more. Being a UK asset management house, we've lent more to the UK than would be the balance globally. So the government ought to give us a big tick in the box of you know, patriotically allocating our clients money to UK based investments. But we obviously have a, a, a spread overseas. But if we're right and these very low price earnings ratios and the fact that a lot of overseas businesses are trying to pick up UK assets cheap, then the UK is going to offer a period of decent returns compared to the rest of the world. And if that happens, we're very well positioned to take advantage of it. We'll be keeping an eye on that. Yeah. So in summary, a good budget, comfortingly normal. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I know a lot of people are going to watch this and think crumbs. We've grown the size of the state. You know, it's now counted for 44 percent of GDP or thereabouts. But we can't, we're not America, um, we're, we're kind of not a Scandinavian country, and we've, we seem to be vacillating between what we want to be. But at least this, is, this has put some flesh on the bone of where things are going to go. There is economic growth forecast, and if this revives a bit of the animal spirits in British businesses and British families to go and do things with their capital, you might get a very nice surprise over the next five, ten years. Let, let's hope so. Excellent. Gary, thank you very much for your time. We'll dig more into the specifics and provide more detailed information alongside this commentary. And we'll look forward to talking again soon.